All right, apologies for that. We definitely can't stop advertising what Africa has to offer. It truly is a beautiful continent. Speaking of Africa, I want to take a look at the developments that have happened in the course of the week in our weekly segment, Africa in Review. None other but Abel Oyeyo, who is joining me right now. Uh, a man of many capes, uh, but I'll go with a political analyst for now. I hope that suits right. That is okay. All right. So um, it has been an interesting week, not just in Africa. I mean, Boris Johnson taking over in the United Kingdom, uh, closer home or rather in Kenya. We've seen what happened in the finance ministry. I think that's the best place to start right here at home. Yeah. Um, Henry Rotich uh, pleaded not guilty to the various charges that were set before him in the chief magistrate's court right there. Um, Let's just take a look at what implications it has had in the course of the last three days in terms of the political space in the country, um, since this is a very sensitive docket. And uh, we've had various leaders come out in defense in the Aroren Kimare Dam's probe. What implications might this have? I think uh, the president wants to do what we call an economic reset. Uh, I'd like us to remember that uh, Rotich has been uh, finance minister for close to six years now. That is since uh, the president, of course, was elected. So he's someone who's worked with the president very closely for a long time. And again, we can dial back to the time when the president was a finance minister. Mm -hmm. Rotich was part of the team that was in the finance ministry. Sure. So they've traveled some distance together. So he had some level of confidence in him. Now, what has happened over the last six years, that is Uru's first term and then, of course, like two years into his second term, is lack of economic progress. So we've seen policies uh, so much uh, bent towards borrowing and not building the economy. We've given numbers, so we told you, you know, uh, in the maybe previous year, the economy grew at 6%, but you cannot say that. As it happened during Kibaki's time, when we were told the economy is making progress, and you could see guys were making money and the money meant something. So it's all, it's all been about numbers, 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 and nothing tangible for Kenyans. So I think the president got frustrated and felt like he has to reset his economic agenda before you know he leaves office. I think if the economy could have performed better, even with the scandals and all that, he could have survived. Mm -hmm. I think Kenyans are frustrated. It's not just the president. Kenyans have lost hope in the economy of this country. Yeah, so I think the president made a good move, and uh, the corruption issue was a good excuse. Obviously, you know, we have had so many scandals. You remember NYS 1? True. NYS season 2? True. We've had uh, KPLC, so many of them. Exactly. And other so, cabinet secretaries as well in the spotlight. Yes. Yeah. So I think it's a chance for the president to set an economic reset for the nation. Allow me to ask, according to the Auditor General's report, they highlighted that, you know, corruption starts with the policies at Treasury. He mentioned that. Now, I think going forward, Ukuri Atani has taken over affairs at, you know, the country's uh, um, treasury ministry. Uh, w will this be an easy task? Yes, I know he, he, is, um, he has experience in terms of, in, uh, in terms of Marta's treasury, uh, you know, fiscal and all that. Uh, will this be an easy task, you know? Well, I think uh, you can say yes. And again, you can say no. It's going to be yes because the kind of mistakes the teacher was making were completely avoidable. He could have, uh, could have avoided that. And all he had to do was to just go back to fidelity, to, to values. Uh, in, I mean, when we talk about institutions and structures, they don't make a difference if you don't have what we call a set of values to guide you. Constitutions and bodies such as the ESCC and uh, DPP are run by people. If the people decide to follow the laws and get guided by values, the institutions can work. So uh, the new, uh, the acting finance minister can find it easy to work if he goes back to the values that are supposed to guide what we call, uh, you know, the formulation of monetary and economic policy. But if he decides to become another, you know, corrupt guy, it can be very hard. But again, uh, now it's going to be different because the president is focusing his lens on corruption. Mm -hmm. So he just has to deliver. What of the politicizing of this whole, um, you know, um, fight against corruption? That is unavoidable because of, because of the so much focus on the 2022 presidential contest. But again, Kenyans are suffering and there is evidence of lost money. So no amount of politicization can make a difference. It's going to be noise because money has been lost and people are suffering. 
Okay, money was set aside for the construction of dams. Mm -hmm. The money has been swindled. We can see the money is lost. So guys can come out and say, oh, you know, our person is being targeted. That is not going to make a difference. The point is, money has been stolen. And Kenyans are tired. We've had so many projects where money is swindled. All right. So if guys come out crying, oh, you know, there's some targeting of someone from uh, our region or whatever, it's not going to make a difference. All right. Now, yes. now, now Rutich made history as one of the first cabinet secretaries to actually spend a night in police custody. I mean, we've seen a couple of them actually named in corruption scandals. They stepped down later on, but this didn't turn out like that. Now, going forward, in terms of the fight against corruption, we've been criticized about the publicity that comes around the arrest, the Kamata Kamata Fridays, staying in, 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 uh, in police custody till Monday next week, where you're conferred upon charges. Now, moving forward in the fight against corruption, I think the emphasis on getting the case through the courts and getting a proper conviction is what is on the entry of the DPP right now. Yes. What, what do you think about that? Uh, of course, Kenyans have a reason to be concerned because we've seen so many, you know, dramas of guys being arrested True. and then uh, Kenyans become hopeful. Or, you, know, you know, something is going to happen out of this, then nothing happens. So this is going to be a test case and uh, the judiciary came out uh, through, of course, its president, uh, Chief Justice Maraga, who said, if you come to the courts with very flimsy or fake evidence, we're going to acquit. So it's upon the DPP to make sure the, the, the cases are solid, so as to make sure they can go all the way to, to prosecution and, uh, of course, indictment and conviction. So, um, again, the buck stops with the DPP. Mm -hmm. They must make sure that the, the evidence is solid. It was very shameful for him to come out and tell us the NYS season two guys had to be set free because there was no evidence. After what he did during the arrests and all that. Yes. So uh, it's my hope that it's not going to get back there. And something else I'd like to add, uh, there's the perception that uh, Rotich is being targeted because he comes from a particular part of the country. That is totally false. As far as I am concerned, Rotich is actually a Uru person. You cannot, he's actually closer to Uru than any other political leader yes so i think the president is setting an example of what we need to do to deal with corruption he is sacrificing his own person you've done a big mess you've made a big mess of the treasury and you have to do what to carry your cross yes so the guys are making noise and saying some part of the country is being targeted i have to remember that kenyans know Yes. Well, the back stops with the president. We can't say it any better. Speaking of the presidency, let's cross over to South Sudan. Uh, interesting developments have happened in the course of this week. President Salva Kiir has banned anyone from singing, get this, the national anthem unless he's present. Well, that's according to what a government minister mentioned. He said that there is an abuse of the national tune, which was written shortly after independence in 2011. Now, school me in the art of governance. I, allow me. Is it a symbol of national unity? It's meant to be. Yes. And actually, that is the most absurd, uh, you know, declaration of art in 2019. There's no way the president can feel like someone reciting the national anthem is undermining him just because he's not present. I remember in my primary school days, we could be given some stanzas from our national anthem mm -hmm. to, to complete. And you cannot have that if it's not sung repeatedly, whether the president is present or absent. So that kind of insecurity is very bad. And that is how you degenerate into a, di a dictatorship. No, right. That is one of the most absurd uh, you know, uh, pronouncements. In uh, his defense, he said in schools it's totally fine. Uh, you yeah, know, embassies. But, yes. But anyone in military uniform shouldn't do that. But let's look at the underlying issue. Why would a president of a democratic country actually make that move? Does it point to an inner power um, power play inside South Sudan? Well, I think what it points to is uh, the continued feeling of insecurity on the part of the president. Yeah. Of, of course, you know, he's had so many issues with uh, Mashar for a long time, and he feels like the elements both in uh, civ uh, civilian, civilian life and in the military who could want to undermine him. And what he's trying to do is to cling to some let me call them useless elements, which he thinks can, of course, lead to what? Uh, some kind of str strong hold on power. And uh, I don't think that is going to work because at the end of the day, like you pointed out, the national anthem should be a symbol of national unit. So the members of the nation, the citizens, should be allowed to recite it whenever they want. I mean, if I'm maybe walking and I'd like to remember the national anthem, I should have the freedom to recite it or to sing it. So I think that is not going to be helpful. It's actually, okay. it, uh, it, it brings out 
the soul of a very scared person. Mm -hmm. And as a politician and a leader, I think that is a big, big, big mistake he's making. Um, in terms of the peace process in South Sudan, I mean, you've mentioned it, that it shows someone who's not so comfortable with the position he's holding. Um, we, we don't know why exactly. But in terms of the peace process, the millions of South Sudanese who are anticipating that so they might actually make their way back home or get to, you know, enjoy the fruits of peace and stability in the world's youngest nation. W what does this pronounce on that particular process? Well, I think um, I, I, it's my hope that the pronouncement will not make a difference because the process has been, um, you know, uh, it's, it's faced so many problems, yes. uh, hits and misses. But I think ever since they went to, the, uh, to, the, to Rome, the Vatican, mm -hmm. and the Pope did what he did, yeah. there has been some kind of turning down of rhetoric and, of course, uh, some uh, semblance of genuine empress of the peace process. And I think there's genuine interest by neighbors of South Sudan, like Kenya itself, to make sure there's stability in that. So I think the peace process is still on course, and because of external pressure, it might succeed. So what, he needs to, what the president needs to do that is to uh, open himself up and embrace democracy and listen to the voices of neighboring leaders like Kenyatta who've told him we will support you. All you have to do is to open up uh, you know, South Sudan for democracy and business. So I hope the process does not get, of course, uh, blocked again by its insecurity. All right. Yes. Now, now let's just cross over to Ethiopia right now. Um, in terms of insecurity, since you just raised it, um, the ethnicity of the political space in that particular region, I think it is a big challenge, which it definitely is. Um, going by the latest reports, at least 17 people were killed in violence over Sidama autonomy. Now, this points to a deeper problem in terms of the ethnicity in that particular country it has been founded on such clans and tribes, you know, since way back. Now, moving forward, we're in the 21st century. We well know that ethnicity is a challenge as it is, not just in Ethiopia, but, but for, the, uh, for the transformation process in Ethiopia right now, does this show that a lot still needs to be done in terms of governance space and in terms of equality? Well, Ethiopia, you know, got a very nice start when they got a very progressive and liberal prime minister, Abe Ahmed. And there was so much excitement, not just from the continent, but from outside as well, because he has a track record of supporting, you know, democracy. But uh, what has happened just points to what we call the so many, let's call it a triangulation of factors that mm -hmm. can lead to, a success, to the success of what? Of a nation. So we, you can have a very sober leader, but then if the, the factors in the country itself are not supportive, yeah. there can be a breakdown. Uh, Ethiopia has nine autonomous regions, of course, uh, founded on tribal uh, formations. So the tenth uh, autonomous region that wants to come up is the Sidema Wards region, which is the most popular tribe on the southern part of Ethiopia. Ethiopia. They've made a claim for autonomy, which I think should be granted. But then again, there is a problem of what we call lack of support for the democratic policies of the, of the prime minister. So the guys on the ground do not understand how they need to handle these guys so as to uh, avoid chaos. The, the Prime Minister made it very clear. As we approach a referendum, you guys are going to be allowed to put a question of autonomy, which of course will lead to yes or no for the autonomy they want. But the guys on the ground did not execute or explain the issue as it was supposed to be done, and it led to clashes. So um, Ethiopia has embraced, of course, federalism, yes. and you can expect more tribes to come up and push for autonomy. It's yeah. a very slippery slope. But that is what's going to happen. And I think um, my, it's my hope that, of course, the Prime Minister gets to embrace them and allows them to pursue a democratic and open process in which they can either get the, state, the autonomy they want mm -hmm. or it's rejected in a very fair way in a referendum. So the 17 deaths, of course, are unfortunate. But again, it shows the kind of climate the current Prime Minister is working under. So we have to be patient as he tries to put together a democratic Ethiopia, which right. has, of course, had a very long period of dictatorship under 
MLS. Yes, um, yeah. very interesting. And I think just to conclude, with respect um, to Tunisians, you know, the president, the first democratically elected president, yeah. you know, Kai Desepsi, died today at the age of 92. Now, he came to power in 2014 15. following the Arab uprising, which swept across that particular region. Now, in terms of the fruits of democracy, I think Tunisia is one of the countries that might, you know, um, be uh, chilling in the shade, if I may use those words, since, you know, the tree grew and right now they have, after four years down the line, unfortunately, they've lost the first democratically elected president. Yeah. But in terms of the democratic space in Africa, what do you think about it? Well, I think Tunisia has made so much progress in the period um, uh, Esebi has been president. And I can call him the father of democracy in, uh, mm -hmm. in Tunisia. So it's a big blow. Of course, we have to appreciate that he's 92 years old. He died at 92 years old. That is prime. And uh, I think the kind of culture he's been able to establish over the period he's been president mm -hmm. is something we all should be proud of. Yes. And just like you pointed out, Tunisia has been able to benefit from the Arab Spring more than any other you know, country in the continent and let me say the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we can hope for is the culture established goes forward, gets you know, carried by the leaders who will come in. Of All course, right. I think I expect the president of the assembly to take over now for between 45 and yes. 90 days uh, yeah. as they prepare for elections. So um, in honor of his legacy, I think they need to just champion the policies of democracy, openness he stood for. And um, for Tunisians to elect him when he was, I think, um, 88 eight. to yeah, yes. 88 years. Yes. They had a lot of faith in him. And uh, I think the next election will have to focus on someone who bears the same, you know, ideologies uh, like principles. him. Yes. So, and I expect, you can All always right. expect Tunisians to do the right thing. Okay. They've done it before. But they have done it before and yeah. we'll definitely be watching. Their elections were slated actually for November this year. Yeah. So whoever's taking over will definitely have that brief three months just to put everything in order. Yes. Well, many thanks, Abel Oyeyo. It's always a pleasure to have you.